And our last speaker in this session is Phil Heckel, who's going to talk about Pennsylvania sedimentary cycles. Phil? Well, I must say that I'm amazingly and pleasantly surprised at the amount of work that has been going on in, uh, in the uh, Pennsylvania and all, this, uh, uh, all these new ways of doing things. <clears throat> those, are, those older folks among you will recognize a number of the slides that I'm showing today. And I stepped down from chairmanship of the, uh, of the subcommission in uh, 2008, and I retired from teaching <clears throat> in 2011. And, uh, and, but since then, I've been still doing geology, Pennsylvania geology, because it's a lot of fun. And uh, working with the Illinois survey, the Iowa survey, and, um, and, and other things. But in any case, uh, what I want to talk about today is uh, sedimentary cycles, focus on scales and groupings of glacial eustatic cyclothems, correlations, and patterns of transgressions and regressions across the Des Moines, the Missouri, and current Muscovian and Kazimovian boundaries. Next slide. And this shows as of 2005, the Carboniferous Global and Regional Stage Correlation. And the, the red box in the upper part shows where the, we have correlated cyclothems uh, in Eastern Europe and North America. And the lower dashed line there marked as uh, Muscovian and Kazimovian boundary. And then the upper dashed line is the uh, leftward extension of the Des Moines and Missouri boundary. Next slide. Uh, this shows Pennsylvanian basins and shelves, central eastern US. And the, uh, we have the uh, deep basins in Oklahoma. And we go up through low shelf elevation to mid shelf elevation up in Iowa to high shelf elevation, northern Appalachian basin. And I should mention that the relative shelf elevation is based on the number and extent of the cyclothems, which are separated by paleosols down onto the low shelf. Uh, next slide, please. And to elaborate a little bit on this, the major cyclothems are widespread across the entire mid-continent to the northern edge of the shelf. The condensed interval is uh, dark phosphatic shale rich in conodonts, and equivalents occur from uh, Illinois to the high shelf northern Appalachian basin. Intermediate cyclothems, the most are widespread across the mid-continent shelf and make it into the uh, Illinois basin. And the condensed interval is uh, gray phosphatic shale uh, uh, or carbonate pack stone, but they're both conodont rich. The minor cycles are mostly present separately only on the low, uh, low shelf part of Oklahoma uh, up into Kansas and Missouri, or they can be a reversal of sea level trend para sequence in that uh, terminology within the larger cyclothems. Next uh, slide. Next slide, yeah. Oh no, back, yes. No, wait a minute, we're, we're too far ahead, I think. No, no, the, you're right, this is the next one. <clears throat> now this is the model for major cyclothems on the mid-continent shelf with continent distribution. And I uh, show on the right-hand side, the source of the sea level curve, and that is the uh, paleosol at the base is marked in orange and the paleosol at the top is marked in orange. We have a flooding surface, the transgressive systems tract, uh, usually shale and uh, overlain by a distinctive limestone. The condensed section, the offshore shale is high stand, that's in a sort of a lavender. And above that, the uh, regressive uh, limestone followed in some places by a prodeltaic uh, uh, penetration uh, with the exposure surface at the top. Uh, next slide. And we can extend the, uh, the uh, mid-continent cyclothem on the left side here uh, up toward the Appalachian Basin uh, and uh, modifying it to some extent because of the difference in uh, shelf elevation and also uh, the, uh, the amount of detrital material coming in. And you can see the paleosol, of course, underlies the uh, cyclothem the entire way. And uh, what we have in the middle limestone, or I should say the transgressive limestone, tends to disappear. There's only a few of them in the Illinois Basin. And by the time you get up to the Appalachian Basin, uh, it's hard to tell. There's not really transgressive or regressive. Usually they're the high stand limestones or fossilifer shales, still fairly continent rich. 
And of course, on top of that is the black shale, a position of maximum high stand, uh, the condensed interval, which merges in the Appalachians with the marine unit, usually relatively thin, uh, often above a coal and below fluvial and alluvial uh, delta deposits. The upper limestone thins down in part by prodeltaic shale lobes coming in uh, from the nearer detrital sources, and then the whole thing is capped by terrestrial, fluvial, and alluvial, particularly in the uh, Appalachian and Illinois basin. Okay, uh, next slide. And this shows one of these classic major cyclophems in uh, east central Kansas. Uh, there's paleosol denoted on the right, and above that is the transgressive limestone, and then that's capped by the uh, offshore shale, the black phosphatic shale. Here, the hush putney, one that's been well studied in cores by geochemists and others. And above that, the regressive limestone, the thicker regressive limestone. Now, the fellow in the lower right here is looking at the top of the underlying cyclothem, which looks a lot like this one. And uh, it's when you get uh, multiple ones on the same outcrop, you can start telling them apart. Uh, next slide, please. And these are the conodonts obtained from these uh, offshore shales. Uh, this is an early stage, uh, this uh, lower Missourian uh, on the lower left up to the, what is now the base of, well, what is now the base of the Gazelle in the Oread uh, cyclothem in the upper right. And the names are in a process, they're now updated in the process of updating by Steve Roscoe and Jim Barrett. Next slide. Continent species now allow, allow correlation. This uh, on the left is this mid-continent sea level curve, on the right is the Texas sea level curve, and the blue are the marine cyclothems, the red are the terrestrial deposits and paleosols, and the yellow is the sandstone uh, coming in from the detrital source. Uh, next slide, please. And this shows uh, the same sea level curve in the mid-continent correlated with uh, Illinois, <clears throat> the long Charleston core on the right and the Illinois type areas on the left. Uh, next slide. Now we also more recently, I've been able to carry the cyclothem correlation through the Illinois into the Appalachian Basin. And, uh, the, uh, and you can see that there's fewer cyclothems and only the major ones are uh, being maintained on into the uh, Appalachian Basin. And I'm suggesting now some possible tectonic effects in the Appalachian Basin. You know, it's the middle Missourian, the four major cyclothems uh, that, uh, that Ron Martino talked about, they make it into the Appalachian Basin pretty well. And at that point, possibly the, they make it there because the uh, shelf was down a little bit tectonically or pyrogenically or based on, uh, on orogenic, uh, orogenic uh, movement to the east. But then you look above, so the shelf was down. Then you look above at the upper uh, Missourian and particularly down to the lower Missourian, upper Des Moinesian, uh, the, the major cyclothems do not make it very well into the uh, Appalachian Basin. And at that point, you might have the shelf tectonically up to some extent. Next slide. Okay, this just shows the Conodon characteristic and, uh, and we can go on to the next slide. Okay, now I want to talk about the Earth's orbital parameters, the controlled formation of ice sheets, at least part of the control, uh, hence the Pennsylvanian cyclothems, the 400,000 year, 100,000 year eccentricity cycles. The uh, 40,000 obliquity cycle today is uh, considered 32,000 years in the Pennsylvanian. And then the 20,000 year precession cycles uh, are, uh, are there all, uh, uh, interacting with one another to cause waxing and waning of glacial ice sheets of different sizes, hence different sea level changes in terms of vertical change. And then if you have vertical change, you have lateral extent change. Next slide, please. Now, what I did at one point back in, I think 2000, yeah, 2004, all the cyclothem, named cyclothems, are down the left side of these two columns. And the majors are capitalized down to the minors uh, on Bolden. And uh, the, what I was able to do going through these is to group 
these cyclothems into what I would estimate as 400,000 year cycles. And I want to point out in the upper of the grouping on the right, you have the, uh, Mus uh, Mus uh, the Muscovian Casimovian boundary, the base of the Farlington cyclothem, and you have the Des Moines and Missourian boundary uh, delineated now at the base of the X line cyclothem. And there's two uh, uh, 400,000 year groups between for roughly 800,000 years between the uh, um, MK boundary and the DM boundary. Uh, next slide. Now implications derived from these groupings, well, each minor cycle likely rated to 20,000 year uh, precession cycles, and you divide 20 into 400,000, you get roughly uh, one of uh, roughly 20 minor cycles to each uh, minor cycles of, of, uh, uh, of orbital parameters uh, to each 400,000 year grouping. And what I found was nearly all 400,000 year groupings included one major cyclothem. Now, I should say that major and intermediate cyclothems reflect, reflect positive feedback of short precession parameters with intermediate uh, obliquity and then the, uh, and, and that uh, including the uh, 100,000 year short eccentricity cycle rather than representing a single 400,000 year or 100,000 year cycle. And of course, further irregularity derives from the fact that the parameter is not exact multiple, non-orbital factors, uh, which, uh, which John Isbell talked about today. And, uh, and then I found that the boundaries between these 400,000 year groupings are often marked by the best developed paleosols, paleo valley incision and biotic changes. Next uh, slide, please. And these were the groupings I put together uh, on the right-hand side. And uh, what, what I found was, is that based on our, uh, the mid-continent uh, 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 name, names, that the Virgilian included 10 groupings, 404 million years, estimating. The Missourian six groupings, 2.4 million years. The Moinsian 10 groupings, 4 million years. And note in about the middle of the noise in the lower right, the vertigris cyclothem is starred in lighter red. And I want to bring you now to the next slide, please. Okay. The, star, sparse, the sparse radiometric dating available in 2008, that's asterisk. Well, it's, uh, there's not many of them. And the, there's one at the CP boundary. Uh, which is 299.0 uh, million years. You add now 4,000 years for the 4, 4, uh, 4 million years for the Virgilian, you get the base at 303.0, Missourian 2.4, the base is at 305.4, and the Des Moinesian again, uh, uh, 4 million years. So the base is at 309.4, but the only cyclothem at that time that had been dated was the Vertigris, and it dated at 3. 07.7 million years, about the middle of the Moinsian. So at least we're in, on the right order of magnitude. And of course, anybody who knows any more recent dating on any cyclothems, let me know and we'll see if they are going on. Now, but I've got two points <laughs> and, and calibrating this, these uh, uh, cyclothem groupings. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, now these show some of the correlation diagrams that we made in the mid-continent. And this is the top of the Des Moinesian and the lower part of the Missourian. And I have to take a drink of water, sorry. And uh, I want to show potential for correlation with the subpolar succession in Gondwana. And this has to do with how far south toward the Oklahoma Basin you can trace the paleosols at the tops of these cyclothems. Now it turns out that. The lower Missourian <clears throat> paleosols all disappear in southern Kansas. <clears throat> Four of them there, and uh, two major and two intermediate cyclothems. The one uh, preceding the Dennis goes a little bit farther, but I want you to keep in mind now the two in the lower left, because we'll talk about them two slides on. Next slide, please. Now the late Des Moinesian paleosols disappear a little bit farther south around the Kansas-Oklahoma border. And you can see that the, the middle six 
Uh, two of them don't even make it to the Kansas Oklahoma border, maybe a little farther south than the uh, than the Missourian ones. But uh, then there's four that just barely make it across the Oklahoma Kansas border. Uh, so these cyclothems, the ones I talked about previously in the uh, in the Missourian, these cyclothems form during a general interglacial interval, interglacial from the Gondwana point of view when glacial ice caps were smaller and nearly gone during the warmer cycles. But they were smaller because when the glaciers started building up again, uh, they, they then uh, 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 pushed, uh, I'm sorry, the glaciers started melting again, they pushed sea level up uh, past the uh, northern limit of outcrop. Next slide, please. Now, on the right-hand side of the slide, you recognize two slides ago, and that's the lower Missourian uh, of uh, southern Kansas. Now, here the Oklahoma-Kansas border runs right down the middle of this, and what we see is the huge influx of plastics. The sandstones are, are uh, yellow, the shales are green, and I should point out, should have pointed out previously, that the, that the Kananat-rich shales, the high stands, are a sort of a, a line with black spots and a purplish color to it. Limestones, of course, are blue and the uh, shales are green coming out of the north. Now, I wanna point out these two blue arrows on the lower left. And the top one follows the Seminole Formation named in Can uh, Oklahoma. And the lower one, uh, is follows the Memorial Formation, also named in Oklahoma. And these will become important uh, on the next, uh, I think the next slide. Next slide, please. Okay, now to develop this approach to correlating Pantropical Belt with Gondwana, we need to uh, recognize the greatest sea level drawdowns in the mid-continent. The mid-continent perspective, which I had for decades before I was asked to give this paper in uh, uh, 2008, is that the major and intermediate cyclothems, all numbered here, there's a lot of them in this, uh, uh, goes from the, uh, the uh, uh, mid Des Moines to the mid Virginian. And uh, there's 33 of them there. And they represent many short, intense high stands when Gondwana and ice cover was probably nearly all melted. But on the Gondwana perspective, the conspicuous glacial episodes are represented only by the greatest drawdowns in the mid-continent. Now, when I made these slides, um, I wasn't concerned as much about the, uh, uh, how far they went down uh, into Oklahoma, but I have now shown the, the, the uh, parts of the succession where you have the greatest drawdowns. And uh, there's six of them here. And the one that I want to focus on, the Seminole Memorial, is the second one up from the bottom. Now, these glacial episodes in Guanwana were uh, separated by long interglacials from their point of view of lesser drawdown, which may include several major, well, we know they include several major cyclothems on the mid-continent shelf. Now the next slides show these major drawdowns. Next slide, please. This is the work by Falcon Long and his co-authors. And uh, in this particular one, I will show you, now I've got something coming up on that. Uh, the Memorial Drawdown, thank you. The Memorial Drawdown went pretty far into Oklahoma with, uh, with um, uh, Pelisols on the top. Uh, uh, pretty far in towards central Oklahoma. Uh, and uh, it's overlain by the Dawson Coal, and that's the last coal that has the uh, great lep lepidodendron forests uh, forming. But then the Seminole Drawdown, about, well, that's the Lost Branch Formation, the, uh, the highest Des Moinesian uh, cyclothem. And it's also the Lonsdale in Illinois. And it's uh, is related to Mahoning coal, the highest uh, lepidodendron coal in, in, uh, in, uh, in the Appalachians. And then above that, the Seminole drawdown was the greatest drawdown in the mid-continent record of the cyclothems I'm aware of. It went all the way to Ada, Oklahoma, south central Oklahoma, 
And down there, they have tree trunks, silicified tree trunks in that area. I'm getting, unfortunately, uh, <laughs> ahead of myself. The, uh, the, this explained the gap. In 2011, they explained the huge gap in the uh, Appalachian Basin and uh, I understand also in the Western European basins. Next slide, please. Okay, this is Falk and Lang et al. 2018, explaining the demise of the lepidodendron coal forest from rapid cooling. In other words, this was a warm, uh, a rather abrupt warm period, the Lost Branch Formation, uh, in a overall glacial period. And uh, he explained this from rapid cooling and loss of more space in the most intense glacial period following the short interglacial. The loss of marine genera at the Seminole drawdown resulted from even greater loss of living space than during the previous regressions. Next slide, please. Well, I'm, uh, I'm gonna skip over this because uh, all, all I can say is cyclothems are glacial eustatic, hence their global uh, distribution. This assumption is involved in global correlation. And cyclothems form at greater frequencies, 20 to 400,000 years, than differential tectonic movements, more like one to two million years, which, however, can distort the relative scales. Now let's go to the next slide. And this shows the correlation as of 2007 of the top of the uh, I should, yeah, the top of the, uh, uh, well, the very top of the uh, Muscovian and the base of the Casimovian, and that boundary is shown in red at the, uh, and, and that uh, green line, which is correlated all across the, uh, uh, these three areas. And then at the top of this, the lost branch is also correlated across these areas. And uh, there's a little minor cycle now above the lost branch, not shown on many things. It was discovered later, but it's the last Neonathodus in the mid-continent and it's the last Neonathodus in the Donetsk Basin. And it's the, I understand, it's the last Suedalina in the Moscow Basin. And then above there, there is another minor cycle, which I did not show on this because it's so far appeared only in, uh, in Oklahoma and Southern Kansas. But I put the, I delineated the Des Moines and Missouri boundary uh, at that base of the X line. Next slide. Now, in these wonderful trips that the, uh, that the Carboniferous Subcommission was taken by our, our Russian uh, members, Russian guides, really wonderful field trips. And they took us to the Afanasheva Quarry, southeast of Moscow, the reference section for the global lower Kazimovian stage. Now this was once assumed to be a succession of continuous deposition. We know it's a complete section in terms of cyclothems, but it had been assumed to be a succession of continuous deposition. Next slide, please. Sasha Alexeyev uh, showed me uh, an, an, another time the, in the Pesky Quarry near Moscow. He took me there to show me what he thought could be a paleosol and that red clay stone above the limestone below, shaley limestone below, and within a more or less uh, uh, clay stone or, or shale uh, unit. And uh, it, he corrected me the other day. It was not his student. It was another Moscow State University student, Pavel Kabanov, recognized and studied similar paleosols and exposure surfaces in underlying limestones throughout the Moscow succession showing that it was, there was breaks, there were disconformities in it. Now the Russian colleagues are now working to have more continuous sections elsewhere in Russia for possible boundary selection. And we all know Chinese colleagues are working on similarly very continuous successions in China. Next slide. Now this shows the formal turnover of genera at the Des Moinesian Missourian boundary, and that is uh, or denoted on the, la on the right post Des Moinesian biotic turnover, the dashed line across the middle. And you can see that fusel and ints disappeared there. These are generic now, not species. Aminoids disappeared there. Uh, spores disappeared there. And a couple of conodonts disappeared there. And when you look at the current base of the Chasmobian, uh, it uh, crosses many of the extended boundaries 
such as uh, Bidiana. I'll, I'll show you that on the next slide. And the only conodont that starts there is Suedelana, which is uh, one of their uh, uh, generic turnovers at this boundary. Next slide, please. Now, all I did here is turn the other uh, diagram on a slide slightly enlarge, enlarge it so you could read it a little bit better. Uh, it shows the same thing with the uh, with the some of the genera in uh, in uh, enlarged red color. And again, the turnover is a dashed line down the middle. The Muscovian Casamovian boundary is the uh, segmented thicker red line on the on the left. And then, uh, for reasons that will come up. Uh, uh, the uh, delineated Des Moines and Missouri boundary is the solid line just to the right of the dashed line. Next slide. And what I conclude from all this is that the current Muscovian boundary dashed line is the same as it was before, but the most useful level of biotic turnover is at the Des Moines and Missouri uh, boundary, which is uh, extended to the left as a dashed line. Next slide. Now this is the measured section of the continuous section of Little California Creek in Northern Oklahoma. And this is the boundary reference section at the base of the X-line cyclothem. The X-line is a limestone in Iowa, Missouri and Eastern Kansas getting shalier as you go south and darker. And it's a black shale here. And the continents are the same out of it here as it was up to the north. And uh, that's where we drew the Des Moines and Missouri boundary because it was a continuously uh, deposited section. There are a few conodonts in these shales on either side. And the ones below, uh, there's no evidence of that they're not Des Moinesian. In other words, they're scattered, sparse Des Moinesian conodonts. Uh, uh, next slide. This is a picture of the Little California Creek section showing you a fantastically uh, appropriate uh, a section for de de defining a boundary based on the appearance of a fossil, which is in that dark shale zone, uh, uh, just above where the white sample bag had fallen down before I realized that it was there. And this is back in the days when we had film cameras. And so I didn't even think to take another picture. I didn't know about it until they told me. Anyway, uh, this is the type of section that you need to have to draw a boundary. Okay, next slide. I do not suggest this section for the Moscovian Casimovian boundary because it lies one minor cyclothem above the major biotic turnover and it's on private property in a conservative state. Next slide, please. I want to spend a few minutes, if I have many left, further significant aspects of Pennsylvania cyclic stratigraphy. In Incision then valley filling near the detrital shoreline on high shelves, splitting and splaying of major cyclothems on lower open shelves into um, uh, minor cyclothems, nested minor cycles within major cyclothems on lower shelves, and splaying of these nested cycles approaching the shoreline. All of them depend upon the lateral extents of transgression and regression related to the irregular interactions of the orbital parameters on ice sheets, plus the geodesic problems that uh, that John Isbell brought up today, I've never even thought about. But uh, but all of which control the timing and amount of glaciation, hence the rise and fall of sea level. Next slide. Now this is variation in cyclothems from mid-continent low shelf through Illinois mid shelf to Appalachian high shelf. Uh, in the, on the mid-continent, they're widespread, well-developed, laterally continuous cyclothems. And these are the Missourian and Upper Des Moinesian and the Midcontinent Illinois basins. But you get up under the high shelf where you get incision between these uh, 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 sea level rises. They are laterally discontinuous cyclothems. They include marine units and coals, and they they dominate the Lower Des Moinesian and the Token in both basins, plus all units in the Appalachian basin. Uh, <clears throat> next slide. And this just shows what can happen on a high shelf. You have major cyclothem D up there, major marine cyclothem D incised by, uh, reg during regression. And then the edges of cyclothem E coming in the paleo valleys and they could be at a lower 
elevation than the older cyclothem that had uh, been incised. Uh, next slide, please. And uh, this is a fantastic road cut shown me by the uh, Pennsylvania and, and West Virginia survey geologists on my first field trip to the Appalachians. And here, the Pine Creek limestone occurs only in a buried hilltop that would be otherwise not seen in a normal, uh, normally not seen. Uh, it's uh, uh, oh, quite a few meters in length, several tens of meters in length. And uh, the paleosol below it, as well as the cyclothem, gets uh, cut off by another paleosol above, filled in with sandstone and colluvium. Next slide. This shows splitting of the Pawnee cyclothem, a major cyclothem, uh, and into two black shales that my student Rex Price years ago traced all the way up into the northern limit of outcrop. Now it was easy tracing the Anna black shale because that's a thick black shale that, uh, that is, goes all the way to the northern limit of outcrop, atop a coal in places, atop uh, an exposure surface. And uh, What's interesting is that the major split takes place and we have the uh, limestone above it, which is the coal city as you get north, and it's separated by uh, terrestrial deposits. And uh, you have Delta One uh, 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 penetrating into the Myrick station, uh, the, uh, the regressive limestone on the lower cycle. And then a minor cycle of limestones coming north, the Frog Cemetery limestone, uh, in uh, delineating that box. Now, what's really interesting about before the next big transgression takes place, what's really interesting in Illinois, the Anna Brereton is overlain by the Bankston Fork limestone, which is the equivalent of the Cold City, with in southern Illinois, and only in southern Illinois, the Conant limestone between them, which is equivalent uh, to the Frog Cemetery limestone, which exists only in southern Kansas. Next slide. Hey, Phil, you're, you're two minutes over. Can you finish in another two, maybe? Uh, I've got just a few, si uh, few, uh, a few left. Okay. And this shows phased regression in the winter set limestone, minor transgressions, glacial meltings, uh, after the huge stark transgression at the base. And most uh, glacial buildups are, are phased with minor transgressions in between. And we have the stark shale, uh, the top of the Stark Shale, Kansas City, splitting off and penetrating, splaying upward and separating the thick regressive limestones of the winter set limestone. Next slide. Uh, geochemical studies by Algeo et al. at the Hushpatni in uh, uh, one locality find small cycles, geochemical cycles, cycles hidden in the Hushpatni Shale. Uh, roughly 12 of them based on TOC, uh, total organic carbon, hydrogen index, organic mass rolls, total sulfur, total phosphate, and, uh, and, and aluminum silicon oxides. And they counted 12 of them there. Next slide. Uh, these plus two minor lithic cycles previously recognized bring to 14 the number of cycles now known in the slope cycle them 400,000 year grouping, approaching the 20 minor cycles expected in such a group. Two more slides. Next slide, please. And splaying within the Ames Marine Interval on the Appalachian High Shelf, Naden and Kelly identified several minor TR cycles separated by paleosols and other exposure and erosional surfaces and about 15 meters of vertical section over less than a kilometer when they scraped a hillside off near Athens, Ohio, where they are both at Ohio University. And they noted, they were able to show uh, five cycles correlate them through this area, changing quite abruptly in this area, shallow water deposition, uh, or uh, <clears throat> anyway, these represent the minor cycles that are hidden or nested in the offshore condensed interval of the equivalent low shelf black shale. In this case, the Hebner shale, which is, the lowest Gisellian cyclothem on the mid-continent low shelf. One last slide, very briefly. And so if major cyclothems are related to Earth's longer eccentricity cycles, small precession cycles are nested in offshore black shales, condensed interval on the lower shelf, and they splay out in contemporaneous nearshore marine shale limestone faces onto the highest part of the shelf, the highest parts of the shelf. 
That's it. I need a drink. Thank you, Phil. Um, we have time for questions and we also are gonna have our general discussion. But first let's talk about uh, questions for Phil. Anybody have questions for Phil? Okay, well, I do, Phil. Um, I don't know this directly, but from my reading from Lasker and others, um, my understanding is the astronomers think that uh, there's no guarantee that any of the orbital cycles is stable before the Eocene except the 405 a uh, thousand year long eccentricity cycle. So they, they don't know. So what do, you, what do, you, do you know about that? What do you think about well, that? All I know is the fellow that I, uh, uh, that I cited on that, uh, on that diagram, by that time they realized that the orbital cycle would have to be shorter in the Pennsylvanian. And I didn't know myself, like I say, I've been out of the business since 2008, essentially. And, uh, and, and uh, the precession cycle, somebody was saying, and this is you know, not based on recent inf information, uh, somebody was saying that, uh, that the precession cycles have probably been the same, roughly. Okay. All right, um, Bill has a question, Bill DeMichael. Bill, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think when you guys moved the boundary, because you did move it, uh, I think, didn't you, for the um, to make a conodont boundary up up to the X line, which actually well, yes, had... because because uh, there was nothing. Well, we didn't want a disconformity, which goes down to eight Oklahoma below it. We would love to have been able to put it at that level, but we moved it up until we got the first incoming new uh, conodont, which was uh, Idiognathus eccentricus. Okay, because the, the actual boundary of the spore turnover and all that kind they of stuff. They are is one like... minor cycle them below, but that didn't show up in Russia, which is interesting. Oh, okay. And you couldn't find that, that cycle them doesn't make it up into the Illinois basin even, let alone the Appalachians. Uh, not, well, John, uh, John uh, uh, Nelson, if he's watching, might, uh, I don't think so. Okay. Thanks. Okay, are there, are there other questions for Phil? Okay, I don't, um, Ron Martino has a question. Ron, would you turn on your video and audio, please? Yes, um, hi, Phil. I, I've looked at hi. your uh, diagram uh, in your 2013 publication, which you included in your talk, uh, text figure seven, and it looks at the uh, mid continent and uh, the Appalachian Basin high shelf. And there are, uh, I think, 33 uh, transgressive regressive cycles in total in the Chasmobian, which would give them an average duration of about 100,000 years. Uh, my question is, if, if these cyclothems are at 100,000 year intervals in the low shelf, and the ones in the Appalachian Basin are at 400,000 year intervals, would you expect the thickness of the paleosols to be greater in the Appalachian Basin versus these uh, sort of mid-shelf and low-shelf locations where the, uh, the duration of these cycles is a lot less? One would think that the, the thickness of the paleosols and the distinctness of the horizons would be related to the duration of time of exposure. I think that's one, certainly, definitely one factor. Um, but uh, as the uh, fellow working on paleosols pointed out, is that it depends on a lot of things and, uh, and the amount of water that goes through it and that sort of thing, uh, as well as the microclimate of that particular area and the position on, the, uh, on a uh, geographic or a uh, relief basis. But yes, I would expect them thicker, and some of them I saw are pretty darn thick. In where? In well, in the Appalachians, I was taken on a bunch of field trips by uh, uh, folks in the uh, uh, Appalachian surveys, uh, particularly the Ohio, Pennsylvania, uh, Ohio, Pennsylvania, and uh, Kentucky, and well, and uh, West Virginia. I mean, Mitch Blake showed me a lot of these. Okay. Um, the other thing I would point out is that uh, where I've looked at the Mahoning 
upper and lower Mahoning sandstones, they do appear to be pretty thick. In fact, the upper Mahoning looks like it could be 35 meters in thickness where it fills an IVF out near Charleston. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. I don't have an equivalent. The, this, the biggest valley maker is the Salzburg sandstone, which comes in under the Pittsburgh Reds, and, and that has a, a, an incised valley fill out in, in northeastern Kentucky that's probably 40 meters deep. Below the Oread is an intermediate cycle called Toronto, and then below that, there is uh, uh, mostly um, in the mid-continent, I haven't studied this very closely, we, can't, we can barely find cyclothems there. In other words, it was a time of uh, regression. Uh, uh, there's a couple, we got a couple names on the cyclothem chart there, Amazonia and uh, I forget the one below that, until you get down to the, uh, uh, <laughs> I'm gonna have to look at my own diagram. But anyway, that was a big regression uh, in, in, in the uh, upper part. And I think I called it Douglas. Douglas is the group within which is in, in uh, the near the top mm -hmm. of the, uh, uh, the it's lower Virginian to some and upper Missouri and uh, depending on, well, anyway, uh, it's a period of time when cyclothems didn't make it much out of the Oklahoma basin. So I would expect a lot of, uh, a lot of incision at that level. Okay. Okay, and uh, John Isbell has a question. John, can you turn on your audio video, please? Yeah, I've, I've been interested in incised valleys and I've been following some of the stuff that uh, uh, Gibling and Boyd and uh, Bloom have been talking about in terms of can you use those as determining how far sea level fell. And what I took from them is that the depth of incision is, is not a good indicator because such things as uh, scour and confluent flow can be five times the depth of in average incisions due to base level fall and increases in discharge and, and all of those. So to me, it seems like there's other things that come into play rather than just base level fall. That's true, but <clears throat> base level is still the deepest you can, you can put, push them to. Uh, deepest you can incise them. Then how do you incise below sea level? Oh, I don't think you did. But you do. But, but you wait a minute. No, if you have a, py a pyrogenic uplift going on or geodesic uplift, as you've talked about, which I had never thought about before, then that could increase if you are, the glaciers are going south and therefore you're going to have rise of places where the glaciers were before. Isostatic rise. Right, but if you have increased discharge or you have two streams that are coming together, uh, anywhere you look at that, the depth of scour is much greater than it is on average anywhere else. Okay, but it's still dependent ultimately on base level. But base level could change because of uh, uh, glacial unloading and that sort of thing. Yeah, but Bloom and Tornquist talk about you got base level, you've got sediment supply, you've got discharge, all right. those things. I, I agree. So I just, I have a hard time understanding incision and depth of incision and how you can look at incision along an outcrop and you can see multiple depths of incision uh, for the same sandstone. I wouldn't be surprised. Unfortunately, we don't have too many road cuts like that one that uh, <laughs> in West Virginia too, uh, uh, that, that are totally cleared off for a while. So, but I think Ron Martino has a lot of really good ones down in the Ohio Valley, West Virginia and Southeastern Ohio. John, I think that uh, because, it, and I'm speaking mainly now of the Appalachian Basin, because the we know that even in the non-marine parts of the section, we were, uh, you know, at high stands of sea level, we we're just talking about a few tens of kilometers away from where the sea, sea would have been. But these lower reaches of the rivers, I think, were close enough to the sea that they, 
at least for part of these cycles, would have had to have been modulated by sea level changes and, and, and controlling base level. Uh, when you get more than a few hundred kilometers up upstream, then, uh, you, then I think you are talking more about discharge and, and, and climate issues. Uh, but looking at the modern Mississippi, uh, they've been able to see that it's been influenced, uh, I think, a couple hundred kilometers inland by the uh, Pleistocene sea level changes. Yeah, yeah. Now, I definitely agree that it's got a control. But to me, it seems like there are other controls, too, that can come into play. And uh, and, and separating those out seem to be, in my mind, very difficult. Yeah. Okay. Another, th another factor that's an issue is, you know, you talk about the depth of incision of these valleys. Uh, you know, you, you, you erode them down to a certain point, but as you're backfilling them, the inner flues make and you may continue to lose relief off of those areas. And so, you know, the, the apparent depth that you see may not really give you a complete idea of just how much incision there might have been. Yeah, and they, they may end up being comp, uh, composite features too and multiple right. incisions. And that's often really hard to tell. Yeah. 